Good morning, friends. It's Easter Sunday, and we're here to spread the good infection of God's love with confidence and hope. And let me be one of the first to say, He is risen. He's risen indeed. I'm Pastor Steve Craig. I want to welcome you to St. John's online worship service. Please take a moment to invite a friend or a family member to join you today and let us know that you're here. Type in your name, tell everyone hello on the live chat, invite a friend to join you this morning. And remember, you can click on the request prayer button at any time during the worship service. You'll be taken to a private and confidential prayer chat room where you can share whatever is on your heart today and there will be a prayer host to come alongside you with prayer and and love and support and may i thank you again for your perseverance through this past year through two easter mornings in which we have been worshiping at home but feeling so much closer to the goal of reopening our goal, our hope, is that sometime in June we will be able to offer a combination of streaming worship services for those who cannot attend services at St. John's and also for in-person worship for those who can. So please pray for St. John's leaders as we begin laying the foundation for that major transition. In the meantime, I urge you again to get vaccinated if you are 50 years or older today, you are eligible to sign up. And then on April 15th, if you're 16 years or older, uh, you will be eligible. I've had my first vaccine and I recommend you do the, do the same. A special shout out this morning to Jenna and Toby who have recently married, as many of you know, and they've moved back to West LA. So we're thrilled to have you back. We wanna congratulate you again on your newlywed status. Throughout the pandemic, the deacons have been making themselves available to you, the whole congregation through prayer on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. and also through the Community of Caring line. And that's a number you can call if you need support for a health problem or an emotional issue or a financial crisis. The deacons are eager to come alongside and to also connect you with resources. Also, this morning, I want to remind you that the small group winter commitment period concludes today. But the spring commitment period is just around the corner as small groups dive into the second half of John's Gospel mid-April. If you're not in a small group or you want to try a new, a new group, now is the time to call up Ava Petty in the church office and she will connect you with Julia Brode, our, our small group support team, it's not too late to become part of a small group this year, that's for sure. It's also not too late to donate to the One Great Hour of Sharing, a special offering that supports the Presbyterian Church's Disaster Assistance, World Hunger Fund, and Self-Development of People programs. From the initial disaster response to ongoing community development, the work of One Great Hour of Sharing fits together to provide people with safety and sustenance and hope. You can donate this year anytime between now and April 15th. And the squirrels are saying, do it, do it now. Go to our website and select Give and then eGive and then go to the Fund and select One Great Hour of Sharing. We also appreciate your gifts to St. John's Presbyterian Church and its ongoing work right here in West LA. And now would you please join me in the call to worship. On this Easter morning of now done darkness, we lift our hearts with praise and we open our lives to joy. We thank you for our Savior, the light of the world who has brought death to death and life to life. We come into your presence with singing, our hearts echoing the chorus of the ages. Hosanna, alleluia forever and ever. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Now let's pray together. Risen Lord, we remember that you said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. We have lived through a year of deadly viruses and trials of many kinds. We have lost family and friends and faced other challenges, yet we can never be lost to you, nor can we ever be snatched out of your hand, for you endured the cross and conquered the grave for us. 
Come then and enter into our homes, into our hearts, and into this scattered church as it meets today throughout this city and across this country. Gathered as your followers, we remember that we are one in your spirit, that your grace is greater than our sin, and that nothing can separate us from your death-conquering love. All glory, honor, and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. And now let's praise God with Mel and Scott. Good morning, St. John's, and happy Easter Sunday. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We decided to come over here and celebrate in front of the Morton Bay fig tree and the cross with the white cloth that reminds us that Jesus conquered the grave, which is what we celebrate today. So let's sing praises to God together. Let's join now and sing. Today is from Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 5. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. Who brings our chaos back 
for taking our sins upon yourself and for bringing us salvation to the world. And we thank you on this Easter Sunday morning. We praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
moment in the service where we greet one another so if you have not already done so please introduce yourself say hi right there uh, in the chat box right in front of you and let us know where you are worshiping from this morning it is always great to see your name come up on the screen and to know that you are here with us and we look forward to gathering again with you next sunday have a great week have a great easter Good morning, family, on this beautiful Easter morning. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this beautiful Easter day. Thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Jesus, and his love gift of the cross, of which we are unworthy recipients, Lord. Though through your Spirit you empower us, you can empower us to live worthy. Oh, King Jesus, help us to identify with your death so that we know that sin is dead in us. So, Lord, we ask you to search our hearts, see where we're disconnected, and illuminate what needs to die in us that we may rise again to new life with your abiding spirit. Search our will. See if there's any stubbornness in it, in hardness, that separates us from you and from others. Our words, Lord, is there bitterness or any carelessness in our words? Forgive us, Lord. Remove any hard and stoniness in our hearts and replace them with teachable hearts of flesh. That our words and our meditations of our heart, Lord, would be pleasing in your sight. Teach us how to listen so that we can respond with words, with love and respect that build up and not destroy. Lord, teach us how to value people as you do, as bearers of your image and people you, uh, uh, bearers of your image and as people you willingly chose to die for, help us to cultivate hearts of compassion and selflessness. Your prayer for us, Lord, was to be, for love to be so dominant in our hearts that it would unite us as one, as you and the Father are one, that we would be living witnesses of the Father and of you and why he sent you. Your prayer for us was that for this love that was poured out on you, would be poured over us, in us, overflowing. Your word says that our hearts are to be human love letters written by your loving spirit. And like voiceless stars in heavens, proclaiming who you are, that our words and our lives living of love would be silent witnesses without words. Love speaks words without sound. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Help us to remain so completely connected to you that we cannot be moved by the world, that we be impervious to all its distractions and drawing us away, because there are so many. Lord, may love be the rich soil in our lives that take root. Help us to abide in you, and love be dominant in our hearts and reign in our hearts. Let it be the silent language that we speak in the words and actions and everything that we do, Lord. Lord, help us to be the answer to your prayer. Amen. Now join me to recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from the heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Jesus is not here. He is risen. Just like he told you. Yay! Jesus is not here. He is risen. Just like he told you. Jesus is not here, but he is risen as he told you. Jesus is not here. He is risen just like he told you to. Jesus is not here. He is risen. He just like he told you. Jesus isn't here. He is risen just like he told you. Thank you so much students and children. Uh, for participating in to make that video for us this Easter Sunday. Hi, my name is Jenna Smith and I am the director of student ministries. I've been gone for a couple weeks, busy getting married, but I'm back and I am very happy to be back with my St. John's family. I have a few quick announcements to share with you all this morning. First, Rooted will meet tonight back on YouTube Live. You'll see me on YouTube Live tonight at 5 o'clock. You can go to this link to get to our channel where you will be able to see today's live stream at 5 o'clock. We will have Rooted Bible Study this coming Wednesday night on Zoom. You can email me here and I will be able to get you that Zoom link if you don't already have it saved. And children, we will be continuing Sunday school every Sunday morning at 9.30 with a, an exciting new theme for the month of April. So make sure you join in and don't want to miss out on all of the fun. That's all the announcements that I have for you guys today. Let's continue our worship together. The bells ringing, the singing, that we can be born again. Hear the bells ringing, the singing, Christ is risen from the dead. The angel of the one the tombstone said, He is risen just as He said. Please, 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 
began to realize as I was watching this for the first time was that the eagle could see his trainer for the entire flight from more than 2,000 feet above before he came down from the sky to rejoin his trainer. Now what John reminds us is that like that eagle our Lord descended to where we live. They were able to see him with their own eyes, touch him with their own hands and know him personally. He chose to live among us and to share life with us. When Jesus was not alone in prayer, he was teaching and serving and helping people. His mother at a wedding banquet, a curious Pharisee who comes to him by night, a woman of Samaria, a man waiting to be healed for 36 years. Jesus behaved like the closest of friends. And on this Easter Sunday, we've arrived at this pivotal point of John's Gospel where Jesus makes a decision that will bring life to Lazarus, one of his closest friends, but actually endanger his own life. As Jesus goes to Bethany to see three of his closest friends, let's notice that in a series of personal meetings, how he takes the time to listen to the doubts and the fears of his friends, and then shows us the greatest reason for hope the world has ever known. We can look at this passage in John chapter 11 like a series of meetings. And in that first meeting, Jesus spends time with his disciples where he makes it clear that he is a friend of the fearful. Let's begin reading in chapter 11 with verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. 
Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, but rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the authorities were just now trying to stone you. Are, are you going there again? Jesus answered, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I I'm glad I was not there so that you might believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now I want you to picture that moment when Jesus learns that Lazarus is ill. He knows that if he returns to Judea again to see Mary and Martha and to go to the tomb of Lazarus, that he will set in motion the events that lead to his death. The disciples are not real thrilled about what Jesus intends to do, which is not surprising because the last time he was there, he almost got himself killed. Rabbi, the temple authorities were just trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus doesn't waver. Instead, he says, I am going there. I am going there despite the risk of inflaming more opposition to me. I'm going there knowing I will soon be arrested and put to death. I'm going there to show the power of God's love. Now, for his part, Thomas says, let's go with him that we might die with him. Did you catch that? Is he being courageous or has he just resigned to his fate? It seems like it's a little bit of both. And we can relate to Thomas, not wanting to go, but feeling like ye, we have to go. Now, where have you had to go lately that you really didn't want to go? And where must you go right now that you would like to avoid going? A medical appointment, another online classroom, a stressful work meeting, an uncomfortable family gathering. Over the past 12 months, there are many, many places we did not want to go. But wherever you may be this morning, Jesus says, I am going there with you because there's no place that you must go that I will not go as your Lord, even to death itself. Now Jesus' second meeting takes place with Martha, where he offers hope for the skeptical and the discouraged. Let's continue with verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jewish people had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Hmm. When Martha goes out to meet Jesus, her first words reveal her honest feelings, her despair. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have died. Martha, Martha fears it's too late, even for Jesus. And she reminds him that Lazarus has been dead four days. Obviously, dead is dead, but to be dead for four days was, well, it was even deader because it was believed that the soul separated from the body on the fourth day. So Martha's point 
is that this problem was bigger than even Jesus can handle. Nevertheless, Jesus tells her, your brother will rise again. And from Martha's response, we know that she thought Jesus was trying to console her with a theological platitude because of the way she responds. I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And those words conveyed that Martha understood all the dogma of her faith. She believed in the resurrection at the end of time, but she did not yet understand who Jesus really was. And so Jesus makes it clear, wait a minute, I am the resurrection and the life, and those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Wow, Martha's feelings are completely understandable, but Jesus doesn't see life the way we do. The grave of Lazarus points to the cross and the empty tomb where we learn that no prayer spoken, no suffering or pain endured, and no act of love is ever in vain. But now we need to follow Jesus to his third meeting with Mary, where he sheds tears with the tearful. Let's read on in verse 28. When Martha had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the people who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the people said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? It's important for us to recognize that Jesus responded to the doubt and despair of Mary and Martha, not simply with words. He responded with his heart. When Mary comes to him weeping for her brother, the RSV in the NIV Bible says that he was deeply moved or greatly disturbed. And then we read in verse 35 that Jesus began to weep, or literally, Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible, the shortest verse. But why did Jesus weep? After all, he knew what he was about to do. He knew how the story would end. Yet as he looks around him at Mary and Martha and the crowds who grieved at the grave of, of the one he loved, he joins that procession of sorrow for his friend. And, and it reminds us that part of what it means to be human is to love so well that we feel the absence, the heartache of the one we love with a terrible, terrible pain. Jesus weeps with us in our grief, and he weeps because for many, grief comes without hope. As Jesus looks at us in our grief with compassion in his eyes, it is our certainty that death is the final reality that breaks his heart. As Paul once said, Jesus' friends grieved as others do who have no hope. Despite the promises of scripture, despite the signs that Jesus had performed among them which pointed to his divine mastery over every phase of life, despite the word he proclaimed and his promise of eternal life, they mourned as others do who have no hope. Nevertheless, he did not come to condemn them for their lack of faith. He came to grieve with them. He came to carry their sorrows. He understood their pain. When we are hurting, we don't need friends to preach at us or give us advice. We need friends to quietly sit with us, to share their time with us, and maybe even cry with us. And the one who sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane knew what it was to grieve with friends. But let's go on to the fourth and the final meeting when Jesus meets with Lazarus, or his prayers move the immovable. Let's read verse 38 and following. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. 
Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they might believe that you sent me. Then, when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, and his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus moves the immovable. The son of man, the son of God is the first mover here. He is moved by love, moved by love. And he moves those around him with God's power. He prays not only for Lazarus, but he prays for the gathered crowd and for us. He prays aloud so that the crowd around him can see what is always the case. Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they might believe that you sent me. Jesus wanted those who were listening to be filled with faith and confidence in God's power and love. Then Jesus approaches the tomb where there is an already rotting corpse inside, and there he cries out with a loud voice, and we can only imagine it, Lazarus, come out. Notice first that Jesus calls him by name, because Jesus, as we learned last week, is the good shepherd. He calls our names because he knows our names, and he loves us, each one. And yet this is not just a big meeting between Jesus and Lazarus, but between Jesus and death. As Dale Bruner puts it, an immovable object meets an irresistible force. Death meets Christ and Christ conquers. Death is powerful, but it is not all powerful. What Jesus reveals, it's God's life-giving power. And on Easter morning, when Jesus rises from death, never to die again, he reveals that death is permanently defeated in his name. So Jesus cries with this loud voice, the shadow of death has met its match and Lazarus comes forth. And then Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. I love that. Unbind him, Jesus says to the crowd. I love that Jesus doesn't do all the work. He leaves some stuff for us to do. Certainly Jesus could have unbound Lazarus himself, but instead he sets us on our feet to join him in his work. He unbinds us from fear and self-doubt and sets us free to go in his name. We begin by simply practicing God's presence and calling him to mind in our daily activities. Maybe we begin by simply praying or humming a song that reminds us of God. Or we talk or we write about God. We seek to relieve suffering in a prayerful spirit. Maybe we go to work calling to mind God's presence. We whisper to God. We, we look at a picture or a symbol of Jesus. We, we read a scripture verse or a poem about God. We breathe a simple prayer for the people that we meet on the street. We give the gift of listening without trying to fix the problem. We help someone in a practical way for Jesus' sake. And we remind them that God loves them. We stand for one who cannot stand for themselves. Frank Laubach once said that when we do simple things like these throughout the day, The titanic forces of the universe bend like gravity to pull things and people in our direction because we are going in God's direction. Friends, I began by saying that our Lord, like an eagle, could fly high above us. We know that, but chose instead to be seen and known here with us on the ground. The story of Lazarus shows us the immense loving care of Christ for his suffering friends, who knows better than we do that suffering is not the last word. I remember praying 
with my home church for a five-year-old boy with a serious illness that caused him to lapse into a coma. He was the son of our church organist and the congregation had prayed for him for months and he seemed only to grow sicker. We were slowly resigning to what was. It was so hard to understand God's purpose in all of this. Doubt and despair seemed to be taking its toll. And then I got a phone call one morning saying that the boy was pronounced brain dead by the doctors. And that morning, I sadly opened my devotional Bible where the reading for the day was John chapter 11, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life, and those who believe in me, if, even if they die, yet shall they live. I took so much solace in the words of Jesus that day, so beautifully timed, even as I grieved the death of this little boy. But you know, the next day, my phone rang. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The child who was totally unresponsive the day before had revived and his brain activity had returned to normal. He was alive, really alive. And today he's a healthy young man. I remember going back to that scripture, speechless with gratitude. And yet, if I'm honest, I had some other thoughts too. I thought of those who haven't been healed, those whose conditions haven't improved after prayer. Today, I think of those who have lost loved ones during COVID-19 or jobs, or who've experienced violence or emotional and even religious abuse. Life doesn't always work out the way we would choose or plan, but that's when the Lord reminded me this, that he chose love instead of hate, that he chose forgiveness instead of revenge, that he chose to bear our sins on the cross, that we might walk with him from an empty tomb. Let's declare his words again on this Easter morning, that solemn promise of our Savior, I am the resurrection and the life, and those who believe in me, even if they die, yet shall they live. Let's ponder that in this moment of silent prayer. Would you join me now in this prayer of response? Lord of resurrection life, you gave us the sure sign of your power to deliver us from sin and death and to renew the whole creation when you rose from the dead. Yet we confess that sometimes we still fall into doubt and fear, failing to listen for your voice. We are distracted by worry and the quest for things that do not last. We neglect the harassed and helpless who long for God. We cling to selfish ways and doubt your power to make all things new. Forgive our lack of faith. Have mercy on our weakness. Raise us from death-dealing sin and shame that by your grace we may live eternally with Christ, the resurrection and the life. May we praise you this day and all the days to come with lives of justice and mercy and love. Hallelujah. Christ our Savior has died. Hallelujah. Christ our Lord is risen. Hallelujah. Christ will come again. And all God's people said, Amen. And now let's join in this resurrection hymn. Thou, O oh, death, is one. 
And now let's receive the benediction this morning. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for by his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And now I'd like to invite you to stay and chat after the service on this Easter morning to the virtual Morton Bay Fig Tree. And a reminder to make a special one-time gift to the one great hour of sharing benefiting the Presbyterian Church Disaster Assistance, the World Hunger Fund, the Self-Development of Peoples. Please donate anytime between now and April 15th. It's a terrific opportunity to use your material resources in a global and Christ-honoring way. In case you're wondering, I look forward to seeing you every Wednesday at 1 p.m. for my online coffee break, and our deacons look forward to seeing you when you join them on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. for their Zoom prayer meeting. Remember as well, St. John's Community of Caring Line is the number to call for any kind of physical or spiritual need. Call our Community of Caring Line and our deacons will be in touch with you ASAP. Have a beautiful Easter, Easter afternoon and I'll see you again soon.